evening, and thank you for joining us on the Illinois Newsroom Facebook page. I'm Lee Gaines, education reporter at Illinois Newsroom and WILL. Over the next hour and a half, we're going to talk about campus police, and we're going to address a number of issues, including the role of university police, who they arrest and why, as well as the perspective of both students and scholars, and why activists on this campus want to defund and eventually abolish the University of Illinois Police Department. Just a reminder, this is part one of a two-part conversation on campus policing. Tonight, we're going to focus on the debate, and on February 25th, we'll meet again with some different panelists to discuss potential solutions. So first, I want to place our conversation in a national context. At college and university campuses in Connecticut, Michigan, California, and here in Illinois, students and faculty are calling on their institutions to defund and abolish their campus police departments. That includes students on this campus. And many of those movements either began or gained significant momentum after the killing last year of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. Activists say police on the U of I's Urbana campus have for years targeted students of color and that the eight plus million dollar annual budget for the UIPD could be better spent on mental health and other services for students. Campus police officers, however, say they're a necessary part of college life, that they protect both university property and the people who make up the university community. For those of you watching this panel on Facebook, I encourage you to submit questions that we can pass along to our panelists. Um, you can do that by writing in the comments section, or you can also text your questions to 217-803-0730. Again, that number is 217-803-0730. Zero. So first, I'm going to introduce our panelists this evening. We have Alice Carey, who is the Executive Director of Public Safety and the Chief of the University of Illinois Police Department. We also have Latrell Crawford, who is an activist and a senior studying theater at the University of Illinois. And Sean Garrick is the University of Illinois' Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The mission of the office is to move the campus toward an increasingly diverse and inclusive community community. And Naomi Paik is an associate professor of Asian American Studies at the University of Illinois. Her research and teaching focuses on racism and imprisonment, policing, and immigration issues. And also joining us is Michael Schlosser. He's the director of the Police Training Unit. Institute at the University of Illinois. The Institute trains police recruits from across the state, including UIPD recruits. And last but certainly not least, we have Liage Blue Stewart, who is an activist and a senior studying theater also at the University of Illinois. Thank you to all of us for joining us tonight. So Again, I want to begin by playing a short video to set the stage for this discussion. And just a quick reminder to our panelists to stay quiet for the roughly three minutes that we're going to play this video for. Instead, instead what we want is police out of our classrooms, out of our dorms, off our campus, and out of our society. Students at colleges across the country have called on their institutions to defund and abolish campus police departments, including at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Officer! Overseer! Officer! Overseer! They're just trying to oversee and control us and scare the black and brown people on this goddamn campus. William Burke, a black U of I senior, was pulled over by campus police while skateboarding. He says interactions like that make him feel unsafe. I'm paying this money to go to the school. I'm putting in my time to go here. And then they have like the cops there to just make me know that even though I go here and this is my school, it's not my place. That's how it feels to me, at least. Activists say students of color are over-policed on the U of I campus, and arrest data shows that between 2016 and 2019, more than half of the people taken to jail by UIPD were black. Black students make up only about 7% of the student body. Meanwhile, most of the UIPD officers are white. UIPD Chief Alice Carey says systemic racism in other parts of society contributes to the high numbers of people of color getting arrested. You know, we don't dictate who commits crime. It doesn't come with a color. It comes with an act. 
Carrie says the department is trying to improve by taking steps to engage with communities of color and hiring social workers to staff patrol units. We're not all out doing the wrong things of what you see on television. There's some very compassionate, empathetic law enforcement professionals that are here to help. But student activists say it will take more than reforms for them to feel comfortable on campus. Latrell Crawford, a black U of I senior, says when he imagines a police-free campus, he feels safer. With policing and the stereotypes and, you know, being here, it's, it's hard to do that when you don't even feel safe. Like, I don't feel safe comf- like just comfortably walking on the, on, on the campus. I want to be able to do that freely without... You know, the stereotypes exist and the systems exist and that oppress us and marginalize us. While UIPD acknowledges that it can do better and is taking steps to improve, activists on campus continue to advocate for the defunding and abolishment of the department. Great. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And just a reminder that you can text your questions, which we will get to in the second half of today's panel, to 217-803-0730, or you can just enter them into the Facebook chat. Uh, Chief Carey, I'd love to start the conversation with a brief overview of what you believe the U of I Police Department's role on this campus is and what it should be moving forward. Well, simply put, our, our, our role is to provide a safe and secure environment for the campus environment so our students, faculty, and staff can succeed academically and professionally. And that means a lot of things. And, you know, here's a few highlights that we have. We operate 24 hours, seven days a week. And we have emergency services that so we can respond to um, our campus community for members that call in that are experiencing something that puts themselves or others in danger. So we respond in that regard. Um, We are specially trained. Um, We're uniquely qualified to address issues that affects especially students like sex assault, substance abuse, and mental health crises that occur. Um, Our officers are sensitive to the fact that, that students are young adults and they make mistakes. And so, we're, we're equipped with finding alternatives and alternative, alternative ways of finding um, situations and resolutions to these situations. And when appropriate, we try to address you know, things through the universities so we don't have to turn to the criminal justice system. So um, I think that's an asset and that's something that campus um, cops bring. We also have a full investigative unit that follows up on, on cases for us and we have a community outreach and support team that specializes in engagement and it helps address the mental health issues that we're experiencing as well. Our department also has an emergency management department too, so they help with emergency planning, uh, active shooter, the pandemic is a good example of what our emergency um, uh, planning office does. So that's kind of a short list in a nutshell is, is a, a small overview of what campus, our campus policing does. I appreciate that. And um, the documents I've seen say that the department this year has an annual budget of about $8.2 million. Um, just for everyone who's watching, can you briefly describe how that money is spent? Sure. Um, A lot of the money is spent on our resources for serving our campus. So the vast majority of our of our budget, about 80 to 85 percent, is spent on personnel. We have 65 authorized um, sworn police officer positions, and we have 35 non-sworn positions. So the rest is spent on equipment, uh, mostly vehicles, body cameras, radios, and the technology and things like that. Um, Those are the really big ticket items that we have. And of course, officers need the equipment as well in the field to do their jobs. So that's a smaller portion of our budget. Training has become larger and larger, um, a big budget item that's contained within the $8 million budget. We spend hundreds of hours in training every year and things like crisis intervention, um, use of force, de-escalation and other educational um, incentives to keep our officers up to date legal updates. Um, We have statutory requirements that require us to go to training in so many hours um, throughout the years. So, you know, it's a 
$8 million budget, but it's a very small portion of the university's overall budget. And in my opinion, it's a small price to pay for the safety of the 65,000 people on our campus. And, and one thing I want to point out and make sure that the people watching understand, um, the UIPD officers who patrol this campus, they have the same powers of arrest um, that municipal police in Champaign and Urbana have, that basically state police also have. <clears throat> is that correct? It is. Um, we, we, we all have the same training. We're state certified police officers. And I would say that the job of the university police can be a little more difficult in ways. And like I said, there are certain situations that might regular encounter in college campuses that are not common for municipal police departments. Uh, mental health is a huge example. Uh, we spent over 700 hours on mental health crises in a single year, and that's a lot of hours. So we need that special training for these special situations. So that's why, you know, we formed a community outreach and support team. Um, that's why we're, we're forming up a co-responder model and we're bolstering our crisis intervention training. So if, when it comes down to it, um, the University of Illinois is, is, is in fact a city within a city. So with the population that we're, we're tasked with, you know, ensuring a safe environment with. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, I want to make sure we, we maintain a safe environment and a safe campus. So that's pretty much you know, what we're tasked with as far as our, um, our police powers. And Naomi, I want to bring you into the conversation now. Can you define uh, police abolition for those of us who might be watching who might not know what that is? And can you also explain where the term came from? Yeah, first of all, I wanna thank you for your reporting, Lee, um, and for doing all the FOIA requests and getting all of that data that we've been asking for for a while. So I really appreciate the work that you've been doing. So just to be, I wanna be succinct. Um, I could talk for many hours on abolition. So students, if you wanna get in touch with me and go deeper, let me know. Um, but I would say that there is a two-part definition to abolition. Um, it is rooted in addressing the root causes of social problems and transforming those root problems instead of criminalizing them the way police do. So what this means is that abolitionists believe in eliminating institutions of violence and oppression like prisons, police, surveillance apparatuses, which do not prevent or solve harm and violence. I have a lot of receipts about this, um, but actually make harm and violence much, much worse. Right? So instead of investing in such non-solutions as more policing and prisons, um, abolition requires a really deep re-envisioning of our society in which these uh, institutions of state violence are no longer necessary. Like we don't need police so much if we have if, if our society invests in each other. Right. Um, so as important as it is to break down and eliminate um, these institutions of violent harm is also the it's as important to build up institutions of collective care and of accountability. And it's the, this kind of accountability that police are not held to. Right. So we want to build up these institutions of real care around housing, health care, education, jobs, healthy food, and then building up strong social bonds across members of our community. Right, so I think um, uh, this one activist scholar, Ruthie Gilmore, puts it really well. She says that abolition is not about present, is about presence, not absence. It is about building life affirming institutions, which prisons and police fundamentally are not. What abolition is not is um, just abolishing police, prisons, and surveillance, and then that's it, leaving you, the individual, to fend for your own safety. That is not what abolition is. It is about those positive investments in life affirming institutions that actually deliver what we want, which is communal safety, right? And so multiple reports by peer reviewed academics and organizations like the Brennan Center have shown us that investing in social welfare leads to drops in crime. And also, we also need to get away from thinking about safety equals crime control. And we need to think of safety much more holistically about people having what they need, not only to survive in our society, but to contribute their talents and their gifts to society and build up those social bonds. So that's a very, that's as succinct as I can make it, but that's one definition of abolition. Thank you. I, 
<clears throat> I appreciate that. And I've heard from sources I've talked to about abolition that it's it's a creative project uh, fundamentally. And I think that that's what you were getting at. Um, I, I want to also acknowledge that you are a professor on this campus. So you are impacted personally by the things that happen on this campus. You know, I'm curious what you've heard from your own uh, students and what you've seen or witnessed um, as it relates to policing on this campus by UIPD. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So um, even though I am a member of this campus, I am not subject to the kinds of policing that many of my students come and talk to me about. I have heard for years, basically since I arrived here, for example, that the presence of police at FAR and PAR, the dormitories that are much um, more affordable, they're the more affordable housing options for our students, and therefore have more working class people of color, students of color, that there's like this palpable presence of police there that is not there in the six pack, right? Which are more um, expensive dorms. They have more expensive meal plans. And so I'm, and they, I, I constantly hear these complaints and sometimes I'm overhearing them. The students talking to each other on Monday, on Monday morning, talking about how their weekends went and like kind of, you know, uh, venting their frustrations with each other. And then I'll ask them a little bit more about this. I think there's also, there have been occasions where police actually intrude on the educational mission of this university. So there was a case where um, two UIPD cops entered an African-American studies classroom with largely African-American studies students and <laughs> led by a black professor to um, uh, interrogate two students about a stolen phone. Right. And so, like, I understand that there's like, a, you know, some property theft or, or, or a crime of some sort. But what does it mean that we're actually prioritizing property over the educational mission of the university? This is our core mission, protecting the property of the university, which, by the way, is how um, Chief Carey uh, define the role of uh, the UIPD in the articles, if not in this town hall. Um, I understand that that's one of the things the university is in, in, interested in, but it is not part of the core mission of this university. Education is, and in that instance, um, policing took priority over education, particularly for black students. So I do hear about this um, pretty consistently, but I think uh, Loger and um, Latrell can speak much more eloquently about this. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm about to bring Liage and Littrell into the conversation, but uh, Chief Kerr, I do want to give you an opportunity to, to respond briefly to that, if that's something that you want to take. Well, I don't, I don't have the, the facts on the officers walking into the classroom, and, and so I can't comment on that. And, it, and, and some of this, you know, with the, the different residences as well, too, um, there's a lot of history here that, um, you know, I came in July, so I, I can't really comment on that. And so Latrell, I wanna bring you into the conversation now. You're an activist and a student on this campus and, and you're part of this movement that's advocating for the defunding and abolishment of campus police. I wonder if you could just uh, explain to us what it has generally been like uh, being a black student on this campus and how university policing has affected that experience for you. Absolutely. Okay, so first of all, thank you Lee Gaines and the Illinois Newsroom for hosting this panel and having me on. Uh, what it's like being a black student at the U of I specifically. It is definitely a space where you feel alienated. Unless you find the community in which you can succeed and thrive, you feel alienated. You exist within a bubble and a system of white supremacy. So being on this campus in itself is really harsh. It's ostracizing, it's marginalizing. So when you don't, when you when you have when you do find community, for example, at our parties, when we go to have parties at the Canopy Club, on, for example, on, on campus, and we are being over policed. We uh, over police education is not education, right? So we understand that and we recognize that. But being on this student as a black as a black male specifically, I have seen, I have noticed my very freshman year, only three weeks in, me and Liage and some of my other friends were pulled over. I was pulled over coming from Busey Evans Residence Hall, working on some monologues as a theater student. I was pulled over. The cops pulled onto the sidewalk of the campus, and they told me, "Don't put my monologue in my book bag. Don't move. Don't move." And they was looking for a white man who jumped the fence and knocked some things down. That is not what we need our police to do. We need them to actually go after people who are committing crimes and not people who are just trying to walk back home and, and get some rest for the night. And being on this campus, I've noticed that. I think with this movement of defund UIPD, it is really addressing some of the, the root problems that exist within the institution itself. Systemic racism, for example, we understand that that's a huge problem. We think about things like Project 500, the very existence 
of creating diversity on this campus, where the cops arrested over 240 students on this campus. That is a problem. When trying to really diversify and integrate black and brown students on this campus, we have noticed time and time again that the cops over-police, target, ostracize, and harm our communities. And that, for that, I can't, I, I understand and I recognize that it takes a lot. It takes a lot to do the job of a cop. However, we should never be targeted, targeted and marginalized as we were decades and centuries ago. And Project 500, just for people that might know, it's an extensive effort by the university to diversify the campus, um, simply put. Uh, Liash, I want to bring you into the conversation now, and thank you, Luttrell, for sharing your experiences with us. But Liage, you're also a student activist working towards the same goal. I'm curious, why did you join the abolition, uh, abolitionist movement on this campus? Uh, well, I was also very involved in the Chicagoland area during the summer um, with the protests that were going on there uh, due to the racism, systematic racism that was happening during the time. Uh, so when I came to campus, I did not plan on stopping. I knew that there were things happening here that were uh, as a result of the way that the community here feels about the police and the way that they are treated by them. So when I came to campus, um, I definitely wanted to get my feet into the 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 start of the abolition of uh, UIPD and the other police forces um, that are on campus. Um, when it comes to how it's been on this journey, there are a lot of people who are afraid. And I think that when we talk about safety, when we talk about um, trying to thrive for the community, um, we shouldn't be fearful while we're on campus. We This shouldn't be a home where we're scared to walk down the street as people of color. And that is not just something that, you know, a few of us feel, it's, it's a mutual feeling across the campus. So I think that in order for us to get a better feel as people of color, as a part of this university to make us feel more home, like Latrell said, we do feel isolated. We feel like our events are always the ones that are over police. Our events are always the ones that are canceled early because of the type of music or maybe it's too loud like there was one instance where UIPD decided to come and shut down a party next door to another party and did not touch that party it was the same amount of people it's just with a different demographic so when you have different instances like that on campus how can we truly feel safe with these people who are quote unquote out to get us so um yeah I definitely wanted to join for that reason and one thing that I do want to speak on when it comes to abolitionists of my age, um, a lot of people believe that we started uh, becoming abolitionists because of what happened this summer and like the, the spur of the moment, as you would say. But this generation of abolitionists had to witness so many instances of police brutality when it came to people who looked like us and were also our age. So this form of racism is our form of racism, which is why we're being abolitionists, which is why we're coming to the forefront, which is why we're speaking up. So that's all. Thank you for that, Liage. Um, Vice Chancellor Garrick, I wanna reintroduce you. Sean Garrick is the University of Illinois Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I just wanna start by asking you your reaction to the stories that uh, Liage and Latrell just shared and also some of what uh, Naomi shared with us as well, especially because your office, as I understand, is charged with making this a more diverse and inclusive campus. Right. Um, thank you, Lee, and thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone for participating, inviting me uh, into this really important conversation. Um, I think the things that Liage and Latrell have, um, you know, voiced have uh, been witness to are are real, right? Um, we are in America. This campus is part of a larger system. The things that they're saying have been identified, you know, wholeheartedly, right, across the across the country. So, to I mean, I, I don't mean to be too naive, but um, or to be dismissive, but it would be surprising if it wasn't here, right? Um, meaning over policing. We know that statistically, if and when um, you know black folks, white folks commit the same crime, black folks are more likely to be arrested. We know that um, they're more likely to be the subject of physical violence, even though they're less likely to be armed in, in these um, interactions. So you know we we have to think about it from the perspective of 
why would it be different here? We're unique in the sense, and as I think Naomi has um, explicitly said this, if not impl implicitly, if not explicitly, we're unique in that we're an institution of higher education. So on top of trying to you know, ensure the safety of our 65,000 members of our community of scholars, I think we owe it to the, the state and to the country to really rethink a lot of what we're doing, right? And that is how do we actually, uh, if the goal is safety, how do we address that? How do we become, quote unquote, a safer community? Um, you know, my, part of my job, again, as uh, I think Latrell mentioned, um, you know, we are, it's, diversity is a big issue. Meaning how, as, as students come to our campus, how do we make sure that more students can feel as true members of this community? We know that we have to increase our representational diversity, i.e. the numbers, but we know that also for the, for the folks that we actually do bring here, welcome here, we have to treat them respectfully. We have to provide a climate in the community in which they can truly thrive, both academically as well as grow as individuals, as people. Because I think one of the things that Naomi said I really appreciate is when you focus on safety, um, you think about how do you get there as opposed to focusing on police versus no police, right? Thinking about holistic things that may be um, holistic ways of addressing needs of the community and so on. Um, of course, the reality is we have to get from where we are to there, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think how do we get there? It's not clear. But I think we really do have to engage in asking the questions of, you know, what are the roles of police officers on or near our, near our campus? How do we partner? Um, as you, you mentioned, you know, um, Mike, director of the uh, Police Training Institute, trains many of the police officers across the state. Um, that's, that's a lever that we have for the, the system that we have now. How can we improve it, right? Even if one, for example, doesn't agree with um, abolition. Right, we have a we have police now. How do you actually make that better? How do you make it? Um, how do you improve the interactions? How do you make them less dangerous for black and brown folks, for for women, etc.? Um, and also, again, as Naomi mentioned, the and I think Chief Carey mentioned this as well. Police are called for a large variety of services. Right? Are there ways that we can, you know, rethink um, how those services are um, uh, are provided? To, the, to our community members who, who need those things. So there's, there's a lot that we're, we're trying to, to do, but I think it's our responsibility as a, as you know, someone said that we're a small city unto ourselves, but we are a small city with a very um, strong academic mission and we have to do the best that we can to, to help improve society in that way. And uh, Mike, I'm gonna reintroduce you as well. Uh, Michael Schlosser is the director of the Police Training Institute at the University of Illinois. And uh, Mike, I wanna ask you first, what is the Police Training Institute and what is its role in the university community and also policing statewide? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people that I come in contact with as I do presentations across the campus don't even realize that we're part of the University of Illinois. And we are a police academy University of Illinois Police Training Institute. We're very unique because we are the probably the only academy that I'm aware of that's associated with a major research institute. And just a little bit about the background of me. Yes, I'm a retired police officer. And when I first was hired at the Police Training Institute, um, I started going back to school and I, I worked on my uh, uh, PhD. I earned my PhD in education. And thanks to the mentors I had with the university, um, everything I studied had to do with the intersection of police and race. So when I had the opportunity and became director of the Police Training Institute um, in interim in 2011 and then 2012, um, I was already pushing for police reform. And, and I guess I would almost consider myself an activist for police reform. Some of the things that we train over 800 uh, different agencies, but um, our cars are straight state, but obviously we train our local officers too. But uh, it's a little bit of misunderstanding because we are not a boot camp. I refuse to be a boot camp, right? We, we base things on the adult, adult learning model. We train so much differently. We have, we have this mandatory curriculum that is for all academies. And I said, you know, to myself, not that I talk to myself all the time, but I said to myself, I said, we've got to 
we've got to do things different. We, we, we've got to find ways because understanding, you know, how our country was created and understanding systemic racism and, and you know, Im implicit bias and unconscious racism, all how, you know, whether you're a critical race theorist or whatever, you know, you, you guys all are talking the talk so that I understand. Um, so I started getting with professors that were experts in certain areas and I'd been working um, with uh, two brilliant professors, uh, Sundiata Chajwa in African American Studies and Helen Neville in uh, in uh, the education, psych educational psychology and counseling. So we started working on a program, and this was pre Ferguson. So we started working on a program for our recruits. It's an additional nine hours of training called Policing in a Multiracial Society, and it's based on awareness, knowledge, and skills. If if we're going to improve policing one of the first things we need to do is understand that we all have certain assumptions, biases, and stereotypes. We need to be aware of that. We need to have knowledge of the socio-historical uh, intersection, the context of police and race, and just racism in general in the country. And then we need to develop skills. So this program is ever evolving. It's also a research project. We've been working on it um, for years. And another thing that, that was important to me is to, I, I brought in, besides the regular curriculum, I brought in a course for uh, LGBTQ ally training. And I just think it's important that, you know, officers learn to maybe understand people that are different than them. Although the LGBTQ uh, community does exist within law enforcement. And I, I think the ally training was important. It's, it's also very important to me because um, I have a granddaughter who's transgender. Um, so that's very important to me. So that, that is something else I brought in. And then I also brought in, I did, I did some work with the Illinois Innocence Project for several years. And um, I started working with them and learned, I brought in a course called Wrongful Conviction, Avoidance and Awareness. And the idea is, okay, we want to make sure officers are, are using best practices, right? We know that a show up, for example, or a photo lineup, you know, especially a show up might not be the best form of identification for so many reasons for somebody that's under stress. It's, it's a form of identification, but we need to look at the big picture. We need to not get tunnel vision, thinking somebody did it and then trying to find evidence on that person and ignoring other evidence. So there's best practices and way more than just those examples. And so at the end of that course, um, at the end of that particular course, we bring in an exoneree. And it's usually an exoneree that has spent anywhere from 15 to 25 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. And then the recruit officers get to hear their story. And I think it's so important that when you hear somebody's real life experiences and how it affected not only them, but their in their lives, but also their family is important. The other very important thing that we do that other academies you know, don't do is we, we have... Um, we really emphasize what I call non-escalation training, but it's non-escalation training and de-escalation training, right? How you talk to somebody to begin with and prevent things from escalating. And, you know, it's required by the state that we do 40 hours of scenario-based training. We actually do 80 hours of scenario-based training. We want them practicing these skills in these high-stress situations where they're staying calm, they're trying to be empathetic and understanding you know, and along with the trauma-informed policing so that you can, you know, actually keep things from escalating to begin with and it doesn't have to result in, in, in something bad or maybe somebody going to jail. Um, Mike, I, so we, I appreciate the the list. I, I do want to jump in though, just because our, our time is short. And, I knew um, it. <laughs> and we do, we have a lot of audience questions I, I want to be able sure. to make time for. Uh, I do want to ask you a follow-up though, which is, I know you've described a lot of, um, things that the Police Training Institute does, but I'm wondering, you know, what is your response to some of the things that Liage, Littrell, and Naomi have shared? And also the fact that among the demands of the activists on this campus is, is that the university end its relationship with the uh, Police Training Institute. And I, I really want to get your response to both what, what the students have said yeah. on this panel and, and also to that demand. Well, obviously, you know, racism is a part of everyday America, and therefore policing is part of that. And also you have to think about not only police are part of that, they also have the power to arrest, right? So that kind of adds to that. So 
you know, I, I'm understanding that. At the same time, when I, when I think about abolishing, you know, the university police, I think, well, right now we're looking at a university police department who has a better understanding of the resources, um, the disciplinary processes, and, you know, certain policies that are put in place. You know, for example, we had the, um, the example, I think Naomi gave of um, the officer going into the classroom and interrupting them. And, and, but the thing that we have is with a very um, open-minded and progressive chief like Chief Alice Carey, we have the ability with the university police to say, you know, you, we need to listen to faculty, we need to listen to students, we need to listen to the campus community so that we can make sure our policies um, are in line with um, what the campus wants. And, you know, plus they understand the buildings better. If there's an active shooter, they're, they're prepared because they, they know the facilities, they know the locations. And if you abolish that, then who are you having respond to, you know, to calls for, for service or to calls for crime? You're, you're going to get Champagne and Urbana. We cannot control their policies, but we can certainly make a difference in how policing is done with our own police here on campus. I think that's a perfect segue. I, I really want to make sure I, I covered this question. And Naomi, I think I'm going to put this question to you. Um, and that is, it's a two-parter. One, are university police necessary in your view? And then the second part to that is um, addressing some of the concerns that people have when they hear you're going to get rid of police. A lot of people get really scared. They think, well, then no one's going to be able to respond to crime or that that would lead to an increase in crime. So the first part is, do you feel that university police in general are necessary? And second, what would you say to um, folks out there who are, are really, you know, astonished by or scared by the idea that we would get rid of uh, an institution like this? So first of all, I would want to acknowledge the, that apprehension and those um, anxieties around it, and I don't want to dismiss those at all, right? Um, to your first question, are campus cops necessary? No, they are not. Um, unless you prioritize the protection of university property over the um, safety and holistic, holistic safety of all of our community members. If we just look at our own local context, we have the Champaign Police Department. We have the UIPD, which is the second largest policing agency in the area with, um, in terms of budget and personnel. We have the Urbana Police and we have the Champaign County Sheriff. How many policing agencies do we need to police our students, right? Um, the other thing is that, you know, um, we have, for example, because we have so much over policing, we have two SWAT teams for this small like not very densely packed population. So do we need campus cops? I think the answer is no. Now getting to your other question about, you know, how do I, how do I respond to people who have legitimate anxieties and fears about, oh my God, you're saying we want to abolish the police and then I will be left out on my own to protect myself. And that is not what abolition is about. And so there's a couple of points that I want to make. First, we need to correct the misperception that cops are actually effective at preventing harms or at solving crimes. Cops don't actually do what they say they're going to do. They don't create safety. So for example, police solve just 2% of all major crimes. This is based on a study, um, an analysis of 50 years worth of data, right? 11% of all serious crimes result in arrest and about 2% end in a conviction, okay? The, clear the clearance rate is even lower if the victim of the major crime, like a murder, is a black victim, right? Two thirds, no, sorry, three quarters of all unsolved murders are of black victims, okay? Um, when we think about gender and sexual assault, I'm really glad um, Alice Carey brought this up. 0.7% of rapes result in conviction, while 89% of rapes result in long term dis distress for the uh, survivors, right? And so, if we're saying that we want safety, we want we don't want rape, we don't want murder, I obviously share these concerns, <laughs> then we're investing in solutions that don't actually produce what we want, which is safety. Okay, so what are some alternative visions that we could um, implement, right? 
Um, we need to think about like uh, really like community accountability, right? And having in really strong structures of accountability. And I think the university, to Sean's point, is an excellent place to start implementing these alternative visions, right? We're a relatively small community where we can put in community accountability measures in place and alternative means of support for holistic safety, right? Um, um, but this will require moving resources out of institutions of violence and harm, like the police, into other uh, institutions, right? Okay, the second point I want to make is that we need to correct the kind of false claim that defunding or abolishing the police means that we are advocating for anarchy or lawlessness or leaving individuals to fend for themselves. That is the exact, abolition means the exact opposite of those twisted claims. Right. So instead of investing in failed solutions that don't do what you say you want, which is to create safe, healthy communities, abolitionists demand um, investments in institutions that actually foster communal safety for everyone. Right. And so it's all those uh, programs that I was talking about, food, housing, jobs, education, transportation, mental health care, not just mental health crisis calls, but consistent mental health care. Right? And this coincides with um, Alice Carey's claims that we expect too much of the police. I agree. If that's the case, okay, then let's move some of the jobs and resources out of the police into different institutions like the Mental Health and Counseling Center. Right, And so to me, the call to move um, resources from policing and its long history of failure to reform itself um, into institutions of community building and care is entirely sensible. It just makes sense. And conversely, I think investing even more into the same failed solutions um, over and over again actually meets one of the definitions of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? And so like what I'm talking about in terms of abolishing the police and creating new systems of safety is um, creating a uh, thinking about reciprocal accountability by all members of the community. So that includes me as a faculty member, students, right? Sean Garrick, like our staff members, everyone has to be accountable for everyone else. And that is a specifically, that is the obverse of what we have now under policing, which operates under conditions of unaccountability. And if you want some receipts, I can pull some up from the FOP contract. Thank you. I appreciate that, Naomi. And that was actually an excellent plug for our next panel that's coming up later this month, February 25th, uh, which Naomi will join us again for. And we're going to be talking about things like transformative and restorative justice, some of these alternatives to um, policing that we currently have. But just because we only have a few more minutes left uh, before we transition to audience questions, it's important that I think we talk about some of the data. Um, and so, you know, as part of my reporting, I analyzed four years of arrests made by the University of Illinois Police Department between 2016 and 2019. And if you look at that in totality, more than 3,700 people were arrested, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of those people went to jail. Um, but if you do look at individuals who were taken to jail by UIPD, what we found was that more than half of those individuals during that time were black and about a third, 34% were white. And we know everyone on this call knows that this is not a, a majority black institution. Uh, only about 7% of the student body is black um, and it's not a majority black um, community either. And so uh, Chief Carey, I know that you are relatively new to this campus and to this job, but I'm wondering what context can you provide for this data and why, or what is the reason that black individuals are overrepresented um, in this data? Well, every arrest has to have a reason and we don't get to choose who, who commits the crime. So a lot of the times we don't get to choose who goes to jail either. Officers have to have probable cause to, to make arrest every single time. So like I said, we don't get to choose who commits the crime. And a lot of the times we don't decide who gets to go to jail, but it's all based on the seriousness of the crime and what needs to be done to keep our communities safe. So, you know, we acknowledge there's systemic racism and there's systemic racism in policing, there's systemic racism in just about everything. And collectively, you know, groups and panels like this, we can address these issues and come to a conclusion where we need to, to move forward and do the right thing. And, and it's, 
you know, to look at data in and of itself, we don't have data on how much we deter crime. And, and when you look at percentages of convictions on sexual assaults is, you know, that's more of the judicial issues and convictions than it's the police on the street. But, you know, all in all, our police officers, you know, we have to have probable cause to make the arrest. And so it's a constitution, you know, it's, it's part of the constitution and it's, it's a part of the statutory requirements and some of these arrest data. And so the, most of the arrests that are shown are based on warrants. And we do have to have, a, we have a statutory requirement to effect our arrest on a warrant. So all in all, you know, there's a lot of societal ills. There really are. And there's a lot of issues that we need to correct. And, but the bottom line is the officers, you know, they're, they're trained, you know, they know what's right. They know what they need to do. And with all that being said, there's still, you know, there's this plain evil in this world. And until evil is gone, and we're still going to be needed to protect those who cannot protect themselves. And evil has no race. And I've been on, in this job for over 35 years, over half my life. And I have seen the devastation that people put on one another. And it's awful. And it carries on for generation over generation. And until we address that and get into our children and help our children that can't help themselves, then we're gonna continue to be in this circle of insanity. We need to affect change on all levels and not just in policing. And uh, Sean, Vice Chancellor Garrick, I want to bring you in. And then Liage, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to address those and Lintrell too. And then we will move to our audience questions because we got a, a fair number of them. But uh, Sean, what's your reaction to those numbers? You know, 54% of the people physically taken to jail by UIPD between 2016 and 2019 were, were black. Is, is that cause for concern for you given the mission of your office? Um, I, I think it is, right? And let's, even if we were to assume, for example, that the police, the, the folks in police uniform are, are perfect officers, perfect instruments, right? That suggests that there's something wrong with our community. Um, you know, for example, as Latrell mentioned, or I think maybe was logic, when there were two parties um, next to each other and one was, quote unquote, over police and one was not. The question is, why is that? Right. Um, we know, you know, thinking about over policing, it's a weird thing. There's both over policing and under policing. If you were to ask African-Americans, they would tell you they don't feel like they are listened to. That their concerns aren't manifest in policies or in actions by the police. So in that way, they are under police, right? The police is there really to serve, um, but they're over police in the sense that, you know, rather um, minor, minor things, there's a lot of uh, harassment, a lot of surveillance that leads to, you know, a heightened um, state. Um, but again, to, to, to going back to my original premise of the, let's assume the police are perfect instruments. We know that they're not, they're, we're human beings. We all are, we're, we're right? All, any police force is chosen from its community. We know that we have problems in communities all across this country. The question I would ask is about the accountability, which is to, again, as Naomi mentioned, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, what's, what, right? what's, what's gonna change? So we have to really start to get a, a deeper sense of why things happen. And when we start to see trends, what the intervention will be. Um, again, I think we have to approach this in a serious, rational sort of way. It can't simply be, you know, everything is fine, so we'll just move forward. Similarly, I don't think it can be, let's get to this, um, let's get to the perfect solution tomorrow. We know that neither of those are, are feasible, right? But how do we actually do that? And again, as an institution of higher learning with so many gifted, talented scholars, and this is a very, very important issue, but as, as uh, demonstrated by the number of folks who are here tonight, I think we can make some headway on this. Thank you, Sean. And uh, Liège Littrell, I'm going to give you the last word on this before we transition over to our audience questions. Uh, Liège, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I was also able to get a look at some of the data on the arrest. And one thing that really um, stood out to me was the ages. 
um, because when you look at some of the people of color ages, you see ages as low as 12 and 14 on the list that is um, on the police dot illinois.eu website and then when it comes to the white arrest i see late 20s to all the way up to like the 60s so i wonder how early we're starting policing when it comes to people of color students here when it comes uh, on campus and in the champaign urbana area in relation to the white counterparts also i do want to say um when it comes to the statistics of the 54%, I believe that those are also rooted in systematic racism and prejudice. And let me say why. When you think about the history of America, you have to think about redlining of the African-American race. You have to think about the food deserts. You have to think about the crime rates. And when you think about that, that's because there is a lack of resources. So people feel like they have to commit crimes because there is there aren't any resources. They feel like it's survival of the fittest. So when you have people in those kind of predicaments, in those kind of uh, situations, you're not going to get the cookie cutter citizen that you would get from someone who is high middle class or upper middle class from Evanston or something like that. You're not going to get that same kind of citizen out of someone who came from Inglewood and had to work their way up to become a student of this university. So when it comes to those different um, statistics, I do want to mention that there are also some historical statistics that need to be included into that. So that way we won't have a statistic that isn't fair. I mean, honestly, when you when you look at 54% and I barely see Black people on campus before Corona, you know, we had to all co uh, congregate together to be able to see each other, to be able to feel like a community. But to see that 54% of the arrests came from our community on campus, you would assume that all of us were arrested, which is why we still have this bigger issue that we do not feel safe on campus. So... Um, I believe that the word that is missing from the pedagogical standpoint of uh, the police of UIPD is empathy, because empathy will change a lot of things when it comes to policing. When you're empathetic, you can think about the other side of the story. You're not just thinking about incriminalizing someone. You're thinking about how did we get to this crime? I believe that some of that empathy is given to some of the white citizens in America because most of them get off in comparison to some of the black, uh, some, some of the black citizens in America. So I think that we really have to think about being empathetic when it comes to certain people. And I, yeah. Latrell, you wanna come in? Yeah, Latrell, what, what do you have to add to this? Uh, Alice Carey, you, you spoke on uh, it not being tied to a race. And I wanna, uh, I wanna, I'm gonna speak very, very uh, clearly right now and say, Kimberly Latrice Jones said it so beautifully. She said, as long as we keep looking at the what, we're not looking at the why. The why is simply for those who don't seem to understand. White privilege, white supremacy, and lack of accountability in the law enforcement that is America. So while we are talking about systemic racism by just acknowledgement, it must be paired with justice, accountability, and transformation. Who's going to police the police is my question. I have witnessed firsthand the over-police and penalization of Black students. I worked as a resident advisor for two years in university housing. The number of times in which I called UIPD to show up and how they handled and responded to situations with specifically Black and Brown residents is truly a problem. It's quite pathetic, honestly. And when I want to, I want to talk about this on a, on a macro level. So while we're talking about systemic racism and Amer and problems within America, we have to think about, as Liage mentioned, things like redlining, things of those sorts. We have to also look at things like the prison industrial complex when it comes to educational institutions, prison, prison industrial complex, the school to prison pipeline, racial disparities, economic disparities, and white supremacy must all be addressed on an institutional level. So we have the, all of these municipal police as well as UIPD, and none of them seem to be doing the work. None of them seem to be doing that intersectional work as it relates to our communities. And lastly, I want to follow up about our abolition. Abolition is based upon the idea that we should be focused on creating the, the condition that policing is not needed in our society and especially not in our educational institution. institution. Abolition is not primarily about dismantling, nor is it a negative strategy. It is about revisioning and starting and building anew. Safety, safeguarded by violence is not safety, right? Abolition is about addressing and understanding the intersectionality of our struggles and our issues in our communities. And that's all I have to say on that. Thank yeah, you. Which, and I, I actually want to take this moment to thank all of our panelists for, for coming 
with us through this conversation this far, uh, we are going to transition to the audience questions that we've gotten. And you still have time to submit a question. You can text your question to 217-803-0730. You can also comment on our Facebook Live. Um, we got a couple questions in about mental health. And I wanted to get to those because, um, Chief Kerry, you did mention that it, it, it makes up a large part of the calls that UIPD is responding to. So I'll read these two questions. Um, the first one says, uh, and if y'all feel that mental health is a main problem going on in the campus, what does having all those police on campus going to do to solve the situation? If anything, you need to get more professionals that are in that field. Um, the, the second that we got uh, was uh, given the prevalence on college campuses of mental health related into incidents, interpersonal conflicts and similar issues that require the expertise of social workers and psychologists. And given the fact that UIPD clearly recognizes the necessity of social workers on many of their calls, would you also support the reallocation of funding from UIPD toward these vital resources? So first question is asking why there aren't more mental health professionals available to respond to these calls. And the second question is whether or not you would uh, support reallocating some of the funding that's going for you know what we might call traditional policing um, towards mental health resources and, and chief Kerry, i'm going to let you uh, take the first shot at that question well we already we did reallocate some money for our first social worker we took a police officer position and funded a the licensed clinical social worker i'd be all for it um social workers um responding to calls for service, but you gotta realize that people call our dispatch center, you know, the, the countywide dispatch center, and there's no one else that's gonna respond to this other than police, fire, or the paramedics. So until we get a system in there where we could, we could you know, dispatch directly the social services for those mental crises, then that's where we'd like to go. And, you know, realistically, that's where mental health should be dealt with, but those professionals, those professionals that are trained to deal and assess those situations in real time, our role is to make sure that, you know, the situation in the scene is safe. And if we could turn those over to the professionals, we'd certainly love to do that. But there's a lot of work to do. And I know that we're bringing in, you know, social workers and crisis counselors into the police department, but the, the goal is for the law enforcement portion to step out. You know, once the mental health was deinstitutionalized, it fell on the shoulders of the police because no one else was responding. So, you know, collectively and, you know, with a lot of work ahead of us, that's our hope. Our hope is to get, you know, the professionals out in the street to deal with the, the issues that come about in real time and get the services those individuals need and make sure they get the follow-up and the wraparound services and no one falls through the cracks. And Mike, I want to give you an opportunity to address this as well, because, you know, your institute is, is one of, I believe, seven that are responsible for training new recruits, um, police recruits from across the state. Um, is there a movement? Are, are you focusing more attention to mental health, given that this is an issue that not just campus police are, are responding to, but it's an issue that police in general, as Chief Kerry said, are, are now responding to uh, and devoting a large part of their time to? Yeah, we definitely have increased our, our training in the areas of, uh, you know, mental health issues, just uh, uh, people with uh, disabilities. And, and we actually have created, because um, we have role players that we have, um, that we use, but we have scenarios set up where officers get to practice um, their interactions in pe with people in crisis and varying various uh, you know, mental health problems. And so we've, we've done a lot more with that. And just every time it's like, you know, there, we see that there's really a need for this additional training. Um, we throw things in. I mean, just for example, this, we, we threw this in probably, oh, I don't know, it's been probably at least eight or 10 years ago where we started throwing in more um, scenarios involving um, officers um, being able to interact with people that, that are, you know, suffering from crisis or mental health issues. And uh, so we, and, you know, there's, there's a the thing that we're able to do that other academies aren't. And I'm not, I, I don't want to say negative things about other academies, but, you know, we're more the, you know, guardian versus the warrior, right? 
And, you know, with all the additional classes we have and the way we teach, we, we want, and I think this has been mentioned earlier, and I think it is so important that, you know, the, the, the more we can understand people and the more we can empathize with others, the better job we're going to do. And we need to realize that everybody we interact with isn't a bad, necessarily a bad person. We know that people are not angry at us, right? That we know that, you know, that maybe they're suffering from mental health issues or drug problems or relationship problems or alcohol problems or financial problems. And if we can develop this true empathy towards other to understand, you know, how somebody maybe didn't grow up the same way I did and, and get a better understanding of that, we're going to be able to go into those situations with, with more empathy, more calmness, and be able to, to handle those situations. But yes, we've definitely um, upped our training with development of disabilities and, and you know, mental health issues and things like that. I appreciate that. And then uh, Chief Kerr, we had there's some discussion going on in the uh, chat on the Facebook Live that my producer just told me about. Um, there's some people saying, isn't the social worker working as a counselor for the police? And I think what this is getting at is that that person isn't necessarily a, a counselor because someone's reached out to a counselor, that that person is is part of the policing institution. Um, if you could address this question of, of the social worker working as a counselor for the police, that would be great. Um. I'm not, I'm not really clear on what the question is. You mean helping our officers with mental health or what they're doing out in the street responding to mental health? I think, health? I mean, it's fair to address both. I think someone might ask, you know, are they helping your officers with mental health? Are they helping the people out on the streets with mental health? And then I think the other question that might naturally arise here is why hire a social worker to assist with the police rather than take some of the police funding to hire a social worker that's, you know, in other places on campus, working in, in mental health, like in McKinley and other services service centers on campus? Well, most of the crisis or the counseling centers are closed after five and they're not open on weekends. And like I alluded to earlier, calls for service come into dispatch. And I guess my question is who would be dispatched to those people in crisis? And so, we have to find a solution when people call in and, and need some help on the street or on campus. So until we find that solution, you know, our, our model is to co-respond so that we can get individuals that have the training and the expertise to assess the situation in real time. And until we find a 24 hour, 365 day a week model, um, that goes and addresses the crisis situations involving mental health, then the police will step out of that. But until then, we really need to, to con continue to work. I mean, this is not going to be an overnight success that, you know, okay, we're done. We hired a social worker. Now we've checked that box. It, it goes a lot deeper than that. And hiring our first clinician is she's hired to, to help implement you know, a working model and it's always going to be changing and we're going to get input from the community and we're not taking away anyone's job from McKinley whatsoever. But until we have somebody that's going to go out and respond after 5 p.m. on weekends and holidays, then we're going to do our best that we can we can do to assess the situations and, and give those individuals the help they need. And Naomi, I saw your hand go up if you want to respond. I'll just say, I, I especially want to say this because Sean Garrick is on the call. Um, this very particular issue is ripe for new thinking, new thinking, new systems. And they, they're ones that we have really excellent models for. So we wouldn't have to be starting from scratch. But there are multiple models where you do have some, you do have a crisis call. It goes to dispatch and they say, hello, 911, do you need police, fire, emergency medical? or mental health care. It's not that complicated. I understand that like it requires working together with the county, right? And working together with the other um, agencies in our community. But to say that, well, it's like dispatch. Well, we can't, what, what can we do about dispatch? Well, we like work with our partners to address the problem of dispatch. And then we invest resources into having non-police responders 
go out to help uh, mental health, to uh, respond to mental health crisis calls. And this is exactly what some of our, I hear this from RAs, like uh, resident advisors who work in the dorms, right? That they have a student, they have a resident in crisis and they, um, they, they can't handle the situation themselves, but they need help but they also don't want to call the police because they have legitimate fears and concerns about how the police will respond. And so there are times and there are situations that um, that don't require a police response, even if it's accompanied by a social worker who is a social worker for the police and then also a social worker who works with the police. That is a contradict an irreconcilable contradiction in the job description itself. Right. And so this seems like a ripe opportunity. And I think it would be a good faith effort if the UIPD is actually interested in creating a holistic vision of safety to start moving these resources out of the UIPD and putting them into more appropriate uh, service centers. And that, yeah, that does mean that we need more investments into, for example, student counseling so that there is a 24-7 crisis hotline, right? Or that, that there's someone who's on call right, who can uh, be dispatched to the dorms when there is a crisis. But this seems to be like the students have been asking for it. It just seems to make common sense, right? And it seems to be something that we could actually move the needle. I understand that we're not going to abolish the police today and like have a whole new system tomorrow, right? But this seems one of the positive steps that we could be making. And I think it would be a good faith effort for the chief of the UIPD to commit publicly to being like, okay, let's think about this. Let's, let's, let's work this out. Right. So, well, I, I want to give uh, well, here, uh, can Sean I a respond to that. Yeah, Chief Kerry, go ahead, respond. And then I want to go to uh, Sean Garrick. Well, I guess the question is, why are, pe why are people pointing the, the finger at police to fix the mental health problem? You know, we're out there doing our best and no one else wants to pick up the issue. So we are. And that's the bottom, that's where we want to get to, Naomi, is get to that, uh, get it out of the police, you know? So we have to start somewhere. And until we get that solution, you know, we're still responding to calls and mental health calls, and we can't stop that until we get a system in place, then hopefully we don't have to respond to that. But we're taking the initiative to try to find a solution to make it better for those experiencing crises. And Sean, I wanna let you respond because I know Naomi uh, sure. mentioned you specifically in her comments. Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, in many ways this is simple, but it's also complex. I think one of the things that we have to realize is that we are part of a large system, right? So for example, I think it's a little strange to, um, let the police decide what the police budget is, for example, right? That's, that's the same way we don't let the, um, the engineering professors decide what the engineering budget is. We don't let the law professors decide what the law budget is, right? There is some, there's structure in the university that makes all of these decisions. Of course, you know, each, each unit makes its recommendation, its request, and then that is vetted, that is, um, you know, uh, analyzed and so on. So, and, and that is part of what we're doing. You know, we, we didn't really mention this explicitly, but um, in, in summer, fall, Chancellor Jones launched the call to action. One of the things that we're really focusing on is this notion of policing and public safety. And Naomi's part of this work group. We are trying to really bring the, you know, the best, brightest, the biggest ideas together. Um, Alice, uh, Chief Carey, and, and Mike are part of it as well, to really put these ideas forward on as to how we do this, right? It, it won't simply, as again, I won't repeat, but Naomi and um, has said some really important things. I think um, Chief Carey's really said some really important things as to where we are, but we do have to revisit all of this, right? The notion that we can continue doing the same thing, it, it's, it, it really doesn't work, right? One, one way to achieve quote unquote perfect safety is imagine a police person for every two people in, in society, right? So that way, every, every action that we take is monitored. I suspect we would all agree that that's not desired, right? And studies have shown that if you increase police, you know, crime um, can go down, right? But studies have shown, that, and other studies have shown that crime almost has nothing to do with policing and more to do with some of the things that Naomi has mentioned, right? Whether it's better economic conditions, better social conditions, and so on. The question is, how do we leverage our talent and our rel relatively um, small community 
um, where you know we're, we're all here because we want to be here to learn, to grow, to do these new things. But how do we work together in a way that makes real significant change that is not knee jerk, but is informed by best practice, by scholarship, by again, the energy, talent, passion of our young people. Thank you, Sean. Um, we, got a we got a lot of questions, but uh, I'm what I'm gonna read out right now, and I believe this is probably best directed to you, Chief Carey, for the moment. Um, Andrea asks, what actions is the university taking uh, during its contract negotiations with the Fraternal Order of Police to ensure the UIPD and its employees are held responsible and accountable for its actions, including the disproportionate targeting of Black community members? Why are these negotiations with the FOP not open to the public, considering the results directly affect students and community members. Well, that's, I think that's better asked and addressed to the, the HR than uh, labor relations. There's labor laws um, that we have to follow. And we work closely with HR and the labor relations when we're dealing with contract negotiations. And uh, another question that we got is whether the UIPD has done any research within the Black communities of Champaign and Urbana about their attitudes towards campus police. Not my short tenure here that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, Sean, please go ahead. Sure. I'll, uh, sorry to uh, cut you off. Yeah. Um, this is one of the, the uh, outgrowths of this call to action that I mentioned earlier. We're starting a new initiative to really do exactly that. And that is partner with the community such that we can get a sense of what their needs are, what works and what doesn't work. And we're trying to do it not in a one-time way, but in a really uh, deep structural way. How do we um, build this into our everyday practice? How do we get um, members of our community to, you know, to participate in a way that they, can, they feel like they're listened to um, we establish these connections between the community and the university, because again, that's one of the things about this over-policing, under-policing, right? Um, many members of, a, of, a commu of minority communities, underrepresented, underserved communities, feel entirely unlistened to. So how do we do that in a way that prioritizes, again, um, the, the safety of these individuals? And then Sean, because you're already talking this question, it's specifically for you. Um, and it asks whether UIPD and the, and the university in general collaborate with ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement and the Department of Homeland Security that have the power to deport and otherwise threaten undocumented students. And how can your office go about protecting undocumented students? And would the office consider cutting ties with ICE? Um, I don't know the answer definitively to that, but I suspect we do not um, cooperate with ICE. If I, 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 I don't want to say definitively, but I'm, I'm fairly certain we do not. And, and Sherry, 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 I see you shaking your head. Is that a, a no, we do not cooperate with ICE? Yeah, we don't. If we don't um, work with ICE at all. Okay. Good to know. Good to uh, clarify that. Uh, we've got a number of other questions here. Um, one is related to what is the UIPD doing to avoid repeating its history of still unaccountable police related violent deaths? Um, the examples given are Edgar Holt uh, killing the Richard Turner tragedy and then a reference to Champaign police and Kawan Carrington's uh, death. Um, so this is, I think, an especially important question now, um, given the incidents that continue to pop up across the country. I'm curious, you know, one, your answer to this question, but also, you know, what did the department do after the killing of, of George Floyd specifically? What did the department do after the killing of, of Breonna Taylor this past year, given that they're very recent examples of uh, police involved in, in shooting or killing um, unarmed Black people? Was that addressed to me? Yes, sorry, Chief Gary, that's addressed to you. I wasn't the chief here. I was still a chief at University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, you started in the in the summer, though. I'm wondering if, if there were conversations happening in the in the department because this was definitely something that lasted for quite a while. Um, the aftermath, there were protests for months. I'm just curious if if it has affected uh, 
the way you think about policing, is it if it's affected the way that you uh, talk to people in your department, the people that you supervise? Yeah, since the incident, we've we've always had these con candid conversations, and you know we're trying to do our best and and continue to train to reevaluate, and you know we never condone an incident like this, and it's it's unbelievable what it's done to the the morale of the officers that are out doing the right thing every day, and and incidences like this is just devastating to our profession, and you know. We have continued conversations and we have empathy and support of, you know, PTI and Director Slosser to help us come to better use of force protocols, policy procedure. We have the, um, uh, the public safety um, um, advisory committee that helps advise us on new policies to address, you know, the use of force and, and anything that it, that has to do with you know society and some of the issues that we've been dealing with. Yeah, Mike, I, I want to bring you into this conversation now. Um, addressing use of force, I'm wondering, you know, how did those particular incidents? Um, obviously, they're not the first of its kind. These things have been happening for years and years and years. But how have they affected the way that you operate the institution, the way that you think about your job and the job of policing in general? Yeah, so we, we, we really bring in and have some deep conversations um, in regards to some of these high profile incidents. Um, and, you know, a lot of it does involve discussing race, but a lot of it also involves tactics. And, you know, when I when I saw the George Floyd incident, like anybody else, you know, it was it was devastating. It was it angered me it saddened me. And, you know, we look at the way we teach tactics to control somebody and what we do and when we get them up and then when we get medical help for them. And, and it's like every single thing was done wrong. And, you know, I had other agencies around the country actually reaching out, how do you teach this? And, and we, you know, I, I went over that with them, but even tactics going back to, um, you know, Tamir Rice. Right. I mean, people are familiar with Tamir Rice in, in Ohio. And when you look at that incident, you know, we, it's just it's, it's strategy and tactics 101. They pulled their vehicle up. They went right up to him. You know, we have something called distance plus cover equals time. That's 101. I pull the vehicle further away. I get behind cover. And that would be the engine block that could stop a bullet. And then maybe if the officers would have done that, got behind the engine block, you know, and said, drop the gun, maybe Tamir would have said, hey, it's just, it's just a toy gun, it's just a toy gun, and he would still be alive today based on tactics. You know, it's just, uh, you know, you, you, you take advantage of those situations to talk about with recruits and have some, some you know, some very good discourse with them about, you know, everything from, you know, it could race have been involved. So what tactics could have avoided this to begin with? I think there's another uh, deeper question here, and Naomi, I'll get to you too, but I think there's a question of like, who holds this department accountable for their actions? So um, <clears throat> this is a specialized uh, police force. They are special to this campus. Uh, Mike, I wonder if you can weigh in on like whose job is it to hold um, the university police specifically accountable for their actions? I, I, pro I provide training. And so, and I'm also an expert uh, in use of force. And so the thing that I can do with, uh, and Chief Carey and I have, have you know, met many, many times already and, and had conversations. So um, as far as accountability, that would be within the department itself. And whereas I'm a, a, a trainer of a police institute and, you know, and you, and you look at some of the, some of the bill, the new Senate bill that came out that I don't think it's been signed yet. And you, you look at things like, you know, duty to intervene. It's like, it's too bad. Do you really need that? Officers should intervene anyway. They should provide aid. We, we have, uh, again, we have scenarios and we have for years where officers arrive on the scene of their scenario and an officer's using excessive force. What are they going to do? So as things happen and, and 
we just continue to evolve our our scenarios and it's not just like oh you go in and you do this and that's the scenario so you have a, a scenario you know you you have a, a um a debriefing you have you facilitate a discussion and we want our recruits to be you know critical thinkers we want them to to you know have this emotional intelligence and critical thinking skills you know it's not just like a robot or not just like i'm i'm a cop and i'm a warrior it's like no you're, you're a guardian first you, your job is to have as many non-enforcement contacts as you can when it's not a traffic stop when it's not a domestic you need to get to know people and let them get to know you as a person. And the more I can interact as a police officer, as Officer Mike, and they know everything about me, right? They know, they start learning things about me or my family or that I'm a Bulls fan or a Cubs fan. We can have all these conversations. What music do you like? And then they're always surprised when I can spit out rhymes. Um, but that's another story. But, you know, you just get to know people as people and then let people get to know me as a person, not just as, as a cop. And that's a huge emphasis on our community policing, non-enforcement contacts. Thanks for that. And Naomi, I want to let you come in and then Liage and Sean, we'll get to everyone, I promise. Um, I would love to hear more from our students because um, you guys are so amazing. Um, anyways, uh, I just want to get back to this point that like, um, I do think that um, Michael Schlosser is, you know, saying very, you know, very reasonable things. And I also think that there is no, like we have tried to regulate, we have tried to diversify, we have tried to train the racism out of policing. And none of those tactics have worked, be, have worked because the fundamental role of police in society is to uh, socially control the social order. And in the United States, as everyone on this panel has um, pointed out, in the United States, that social order is rooted in racism, it's rooted in patriarchy, it's rooted in capitalism, right? It's rooted in inequity. And so the role of the police is to ensure that inequity, basically, okay? So I think the main point and the main point of disagreement between someone like me and someone like Schlesser is that, um, you know, Michael Schlesser might think that we have uh, good systems and bad apples. And if only we could train out the bad apples, we can get to a better place. And I think the, you know, more than 200 years of history uh, has shown that we don't have good systems with bad apples. We have bad systems with maybe good apples and also bad apples, right? So one really good example of this is Alex Kuing, right? He's the black officer who was involved in George Floyd's murder, right? He joined the Minneapolis Police Department in order to fix it from the inside because he believed that we have good, um, that he as an individual could have a positive influence on that system, only to end up participating in the execution of George Floyd for nine minutes, right? So, I mean, I think this is a really good example that you can't just like train it out of us. We have to rethink what safety means and how to get there in ways that don't rely on police, which is a bad system that even when a good person like Alex Kuhn, like enters it, ends up creating all this harm and violence, right? So. And Liage, I want to get to you and then I'll go to Sean and then we'll go to, to Mike as well. But, and Latrell, everyone will get their chance to talk. But Liage, I want you to, you obviously had something that you wanted to share, um, but I also think you and I have talked in the past about um, moving away, you know, your own evolution away from this idea of reform towards abolition. So maybe you were already planning to talk about that, but I'd love to hear what you have to say regardless. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, honestly, I was just a bit shocked at the conversation about accountability when it comes to the UI police department um, and how it was said that the department has to hold the department accountable. That makes me uncomfortable as a student at this university because like it was consistently said, we're human, we make mistakes. And it was specifically said when it came to the police side of things rather than the citizen side of things. So that, it kind of leaves a little bias right there, but then there's more bias when you're asking your peers to judge you on a mistake that you made, a mistake that could have been, I don't know, killing an innocent man, 
based off of discrimination. So when it comes to this idea of accountability, it seems as if the police is here to keep us account uh, to to be accountable of us. However, when it comes to the police, they're above it, and that's not how it should be. We're all citizens, even though this is a job, this is an occupation to help keep us safe. Right now, it looks like it's the occupation to help keep us in check. That's all I have to say. Yeah, and I, I'm going to bring Sean in, <clears throat> and then Latrell, and then Mike. But uh, Chief Kerry, I want you to respond to that this issue of accountability. Is it true that um, the department is responsible for holding itself accountable or is there another layer above that? Like, who is the department accountable to? I think is the, the basic question here. Well, quite simply is the community, but when there's an issue, we have an internal um, investigation process. You know, if there's a policy violation then we have investigators dig in and interview and they compile it and and IA is what they're called. And then that, that comes up to whether they're exonerated or it's unfounded on um, the complaint, but it, you know, it, it kind of parallels with a criminal complaint. If there's a, a criminal allegation, then um, that is that it through and it goes to the state's attorney's office. And prior to me getting here, there was an officer that brought up on criminal charges and he was since since fired from that. But yes, we do have an internal investigative process. We have officers, investigators that are trained in that process and it's an administrative process that we that we bet through. And um, if if people are if the allegations are sustained, then we go through the you know the um, you know the discipline process. But if it's criminal, you know, we work you know collectively with the state's attorney's office. Wonderful, thank you. And then Sean- There are times too that- um... Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, that's, that's okay. Um, we have outside agencies that will investigate our own as well. You know, if, if we need to bring in the state police to investigate an allegation. Uh, I, I was simply gonna uh, respond to the accountability thing. And from where I sit, it really, it's the chancellor. Right, the chancellor is the person who's accountable. Um, he you know, happens to be he, Robert, Chancellor Robert Jones. If, for example, there's something wrong in the uh, in, in UIPD, as determined by whomever, right? Um, you know, as I think uh, we already said, you can't really um, uh, it, it can't be you can't put the folks who are doing the work. Um, you can't let them be the ones to determine whether the work is being done well or not, right? Of course, they um, you, they provide their input, but someone also has to say um, whether it's actually true. It's the same thing with in, in my role. Um, when in, in doing my job, of course, I may think I'm doing the best job in the world, but the chancellor is the one who assesses my performance. He discusses it with the other vice chancellors. Um, you know, so in that way, it's the chancellor's executive leadership team. Um, and but, but ultimately the, the chancellor. So I don't want um, folks to believe that accountability is not there, right? And the chancellor is quite keen and to, to hear the, um, the lived experiences of students, faculty and staff members of our community. Um, but it really is, it's very important to, to, for us to establish. And again, this is why the call to action was, um, was instituted. How do we actually bring the resources we have, right? The, the expertise, the talent, how do we bring it to bear on this issue? And to be, I don't mean to overstate this, but the chancellor is the person who it holds everyone accountable here. And Sean, is there a mechanism? I guess I'm wondering, practically speaking, um, how, you know, if experiences that Liage Littrell have shared, I think there are other people that have shared things in the comments and, and via text with us, um, you know, who do they take those issues up with? Is there like an email that they can send to? Is there a process that exists currently? Or is that something that the university is working on trying to, to figure out? I think generally, um, I mean, if, if there is some sort of uh, problem, and I think this is true for any, for any area, um, the, the thing you, for, let's say for serious things, um, and by that I mean university-wide things, um, an email to the chancellor is the best thing to do. Believe it or not, that will find its way to the appropriate person. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, in, on some occasions, that would be me, right? There was, there was an incident re recently of alleged, um, you know, religious bias, for example. 
that went to a number of folks and it got to me. I, you know, Chief Carey um, and I discussed that by email and so on, right? Um, but that's, yes, if you, if you email the chancellor, again, it will get to the appropriate person. Thank you for that. And I, and we have barely any time left, but I do want to give um, Mike a chance to speak and then we can end our uh, panel tonight with Latrell's comments. So, so Mike, I, I'm curious, it sounds like maybe you wanted to address some of what Naomi was saying with regard to um, a bad system with good and bad apples versus a good system with some bad apples. Yeah, I'm me, guessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, Naomi, yeah, I think you, I'm, I'm agreeing with much of what you're saying there. I think we're we're kind of on the same page in a lot of ways because we know that the policing system and I kind of almost like to talk about it as the culture of policing and the culture of policing needs to change. And we also need to understand when I say that, that different agencies have different cultures, different shifts have different cultures, different precincts have different cultures and it's and it's different cities it's different parts of the city it's and so the culture varies some but we, we do need to make that culture change and on my end you know I can only do what I can do as Mike Slosser director of the police training institute and that is to make sure that I am sending out at least with the the, the seed planted um, on on the, the, the racial implicit bias. I want, I, I want that seed planted. I want them to go out there and be guardians. I, I don't want them to be, have that warrior, <clears throat> warrior mentality. That doesn't mean we're not going to treat them how, teach them control tactics so they can control um, situations so they don't get to the point where they're chasing somebody and they can control somebody without things getting worse. Um, but, you know, we're just, and there is no finish line for us. I'm, I'm constantly working on with different um, you know, different people in the dip, several different departments within the college to, to try to discover new ways for our limited amount of time that we have. Been. And then um, um, I also, with, you know, being associated with the University of Illinois, I can provide additional trainings. Like just recently, I, I retrained everybody at, uh, you know, all three campuses on de-escalation training, all three police agencies. So, um, you know, they do have that. And uh, but so that's that was my comment there. I know we're running out of time. And yeah, and I, I, I will I, give the last word to uh, Latrell again, who is a student, a senior studying theater at the U of I. Um, Latrell, if you want to take us out on, on your comments, that would be great. Yes, thank you so much again. Uh, I just want to say if policing is critical, why don't they show up for me? We have to stop addressing things with such cowardly change. It is not our jobs to teach cops how to show up for our people when they are supposed to serve and protect our communities. Again, who is police and police? That question remained unanswered. We black students only make up about 7% of this campus population. I think it's quite pathetic and very ironic how we African-Americans and black and brown folks are the overwhelming majority represented in the data of those arrested, charged, and convicted on this campus. When we think about cops, who are fired, right? And we think about cops like the ones who participated in the killing and the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. When we think about those cops, when they are only getting taps on the wrist, only, only by just getting fired, the only thing that they do is just move to another city and become bad apples in institutions like these, the ones that sit on white supremacy. Um, when we think about what happened just last month at the Capitol in DC, there were over 35 cops across 16 states in America who were present and, anticipate, and participated in this rally cry for justice for their president. One thing for certain is that policing across campuses and all across this nation simply does not work. People don't want to do the work and get to working on this demand of our communities because they understand that it will work and they are afraid of our power. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Latrell, and I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I think this is a topic where we could talk about for literally hours, days, and so I'm going to plug the next town hall that we're going to be having on February 25th of this month, um, and that is going to be at 7 p.m., another Facebook Live. Um, we're going to talk about some of the same things, but it's going to be much more focused on some of the solutions, and I know that we had so many comments. Um, 290, uh, a producer just told me, so I 
apologize if we did not get to your question this evening, but please come again, show up to the next panel that we're going to have on this subject. We're going to talk about things like restorative, transformative justice, alternatives to the policing models that currently exist. Um, so I'm greatly looking forward to that. And I want to, as we go out, I'll reintroduce our panelists. So today we had Alice Carey, the Executive Director of Public Safety and Chief of the University of Illinois Police Department with us, Latrell Crawford, who we just heard from, an activist and senior studying theater at the University of Illinois, Sean Garrick, the University of Illinois' Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Naomi Paik, an Associate Professor at the University of Illinois, Michael Schlosser, the Director of the Police Training Institute here at the University of Illinois, and Liage Blue Stewart, also an activist and senior studying theater here at the university. Thank you so much for taking an hour and a half of your time to have this really important discussion. I appreciate all of you and also uh, the audience that joined us online this evening. Thank you so much, everyone.